Welcome everyone to another episode of Kiwi Talks. I am honored to be speaking to the woman behind The Weakest Link, The Real Housewives of Auckland, but she is also an actress, a jack of all trades, I'd say. Louise Wallace, how are you doing? I'm good. Yeah, no, I'm really good, Reese. Um, thank you. A jill of all trades. <laughs> yes, yes. A jill of all trades, I should say. Mm. So I think I think the best place to start would probably be with The Real Housewives of Auckland, which yeah. I, I must imagine there was so much stuff that ended up on the cutting room floor that never aired that happened yeah. with that show. Because how long was it shot over? Um, it was shot over about five months. And hang on, I've got a weird bit of hair there. Um, yeah, it shot over about five months. It took um, longer than than I expected it to, and it was also a much bigger commitment than I expected. They said when we um, signed up for it, they said, oh, you know, it'll be about three days a week and and that'll be sort of max. Well, it was anything but. It was, it was pretty much five days a week. And do they just follow but, you around for all five days? No, no. All of it was set up um, in terms of situations, uh, visits to things, um, activities that they wanted us to do uh, that, you know, we, we would be interested in. Um, so, for example, with my theatre, um, you know, I got some new headshots, which was actually really good because they paid for all that, so that was good. The fact is, though, that they're now five years old and I'm holding on to them for dear life because I look I look 10 years younger, not five years. They were airbrushed to all hell. So, um, yeah, <laughs> but it's now getting ridiculously embarrassing and I'm going to have to update them. Um, and, for example, with Anne, they would take her dancing because, you know, she's a good dancer. And, yeah, just stuff like that. Gilda and Michelle, they'd basically take them drinking because they're good at that. Um, and, yeah, there was, there was always, I mean, everything, obviously, as all reality TV is, it was, it's all set up. And it's set up so that you get into a conversation where hopefully you are sitting there and you drop a bomb on the others. That's what they're looking for. Yeah, of course, because I've always wondered that when they say reality TV, I'm like, well, how much of it is actually reality and how much of it is actually planned in advance? Um, most of it is planned. Mm. And it's planned in terms of drama and story arcs, um, depending on um, the personalities of the people involved, who's getting on with each other, who's not getting on. And they try to, yeah, bring out the um, the flaws in your character if they can. And, yeah, it's it's pretty unscrupulous and a lot of reality TV is, is very unethical, I think. Hmm. Because I do, mm. I, I do. It can I, be really damaging. It can be very damaging to people. And whereas I think in the old days contestants just sucked it up, now because of the sort of environment we're in, whereby people are speaking out um, against being treated badly in terms of the workplace, um, television is no different. And so pr producers have to be a lot more careful now. There has to be a duty of care. And in pretty much all the reality TV that I've been involved in, which is a lot, um, there was no duty of care. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. So in other words, if it screwed up your head, that was you just had to deal with it. Mm. But you mm. must have developed a lot of thick skin over the years from... Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I have, I have got a thick skin, but that's sort of my personality as well. I mean... Um, I got, I got quite a, a, a thick skin and um, a yeah a sense of competitiveness, but I think fairness um, from my dad, and um, and a lot of resilience as well. If there's one thing I'd say, I'd say that a lot of um, resilience has gone out the window these days with with young people, and I think. You know, my God, to survive in life, you've got to have resilience because otherwise you're just going to be knocked down and you know you won't get back up again. Yeah. And well, even though you can have you can have all the mental health help in the world, but sooner or later it's it's really up to you and you've you've really got to try and find that inner core to, to get back up. Yeah, because how do you do that in this day and age with social media and 
you know, being able to well, find out every single little thing about everybody, right? I reckon in this day and age with social media, you just go off it. If it, if it gets under your skin, if you're trolled by anybody, um, you just go off it. You know, I'm pretty ambivalent to social media. I think if, um, if Housewives had kept going, I would have been far more engaged with social media, but now really I can take it or leave it. And um, I've been pretty lucky. I haven't really been trolled very much. I've only blocked, I would have blocked probably less than 50 people and not mainly not because they were nasty, but because they were just um, a pain and um, yeah, just pathetic. So I'd say, oh yeah, no, nah, gone, gone in 60 seconds, can't be bothered with you. So I have actually been pretty lucky. Um, but some of the stuff I read from, from younger celebrities and what they get exposed to is just horrific. And I would say just back off, just, just, Get rid of it. Don't don't be on social media because you know. Really, I also think the influencer thing. I don't know how important that is these days. I um, I think a lot of the influencer stuff is just bullshit, and you get a lot of free stuff. Very difficult yeah. to make money out of being an influencer, and who needs free stuff? You know, I got a garage full of it. I don't need it. Yeah, it's so true. It's so yeah. true. But you seem to be very very grounded through all of this, right? I mean, I remember uh, I remember watching you on Real Housewives of Auckland and you seemed very, very grounded compared to the others. Well, I think the situation was that um, for the others, it was the first time they'd ever been on TV and I had a 20-year career behind me. Mm. Um, the others were understandably, incredibly flattered and excited that they were in the program. I was um, I was very weary of it. I I said no to being involved for a long time because I was involved yeah. in the casting. Yeah. And so I found I found a lot of the, the, the contestants. I mean, I found Anne, I found Michelle, um, I found Julia. Um, yeah. So I found did I no, I didn't find Gilda, but I knew Gilda. So they were hugely excited and they said to me in the early stages, hey, come on, you're going to be perfect for it, perfect. And I thought, oh, I don't know, I don't think so, I don't know that I want to do this. And then I thought, oh, stuff it, you know, yeah, go into it, it'll be fun. But it wasn't really fun. Um, it was, I had to be on my toes the entire time because what I found was because I was very weary and I'd done a lot of reality TV and I was already um, a celebrity, albeit, you know, an older one, um, I realised very early on that they were trying to catch me out and they were trying to bring me down. And so I had to be careful the whole time. And then they accused me of being too careful. But I thought, my God, this thing is not going to destroy me. It is not It is not going to do that to me. And I don't think it did. But my God, it was touch and go. It really was. So when you say they were trying to just destroy you, are you talking about like say the producers, people behind the scenes, or like yeah. the cast? Yeah. Okay. No, not the cast. The producers. Um, they, yeah, they they tried to trip me up during the entire shoot, and I thought, okay, I've got your metal. I'm I'm you know I'm not stupid. I'll go with this, and I just tried to stay one step ahead of them. Well, you did very well. I mean, most of the controversy on that show, I don't think you're involved in any of it, really. It's all the other No, girls. not really. Oh, I was involved in one. Yeah, I was involved in one because, um, and that was really when I had my producer's hat on, even though the producers didn't want me to have that hat on, whereas the, the show was sort of going nowhere. It was a little bit boring. The shoot was a bit boring. And I thought, okay, I'll throw something into the mix here. And that was when I said that, you know, the, about the rumours um, when, when Gilda first got to the country and that she was out to find a rich man and blah, blah, blah. And, yeah, that caused a big stink, especially with Gilda towards me, and I could totally understand that. And, um, yeah, I had to sort of fast talk my way out of that. But, but really, that was just to get some spice into the show because it was, it was going nowhere. So they actually had a lot to thank me for. Because <laughs> <laughs> was there... Because there's there was all these all these talks about a season two. Was it ever on the cards? Yeah. yeah. Or I don't know. I don't think it was. I I think we were led to believe that it was, 
but I don't really know that was. I, I, I suspect that the whole show was really just to launch Bravo in New Zealand. And um, mm. I, yeah, I don't, I don't really think it was on the cards. Yeah, because I thought I well, I read that the uh, they didn't want to do a season two because of the controversy on the boat between um, no. Julia no, and no. Michelle. Con- no, 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 no. I doubt that very much. The controversy on the boat was, my God, that was what kept the show going. And really, you look at other um, housewife shows. I mean, it wasn't mild. It was pretty bad. But I mean, God, there's been some totally heavy shit go down in other housewife <laughs> shows. Um, absolutely groundbreaking, you know, thunder clapping, earthquake sort of, you know, um, happening stuff. So it was nothing that no other uh, housewife show had ever, you know, hadn't had before. Yeah. But I suppose nothing. And it was, it was real water cooler stuff. You know, when you've got doing a housewife show and this is what we achieved, is you've got to have after each episode, you've got to have people around the water coolers at work saying, holy crap, did you see that? And that's what we achieved. Yeah, yeah. It must have been pretty hard, like, because it, you, you're you kind of in a way involving your family as well, aren't you, when you do this show? Because they're kind of... Yeah, well, I was lucky. I was lucky. Yeah, A, because my kids were living overseas. They lived in Australia. So um, also they had grown up with me on TV and with things like The Weakest Link and Treasure Island and stuff that I've been involved in, you know, I've, I've um, sort of had a few out there incidents on TV. So it was probably nothing that I they weren't really used to. And whereas the others had younger kids, and I think with social media, I think that would have been really hard on them. I'm, I'm really glad that my kids were older and that they were used to be me being on TV. Um, and really the people they were mixing with, I, I think, at university in Australia and stuff, nobody knew that they were my, you know, kids. And mm. I don't think they were really affected. Yeah. And because they because they weren't here, they weren't involved in the shoot. So I was actually really lucky. Yeah, yeah. Because that's I think I think that's probably one of the worst things about reality TV is when family are inevitably involved, particularly if they don't yeah. even want to be. Oh, totally, totally. Um, mind you, like Julia's son, she didn't. He didn't want to be involved, and so you never saw him. Um, you only saw her daughter. But yeah, considering what happened with Julia, I, I suspect it would have been really hard for her, and probably, as people found out, probably hard for her son as well. And I, I felt sorry for those kids. I really did. I think it would have been very tough. Yeah. Do you still stay in contact with with all the cast? I stay in contact um, very much with Anne and occasionally have a long lunch with uh, Gilda and Michelle and Anne. Um, So, yeah, I'm on good terms with them. I'm on good terms with Angela. Um, I'm on okay terms with Julia. Not really. I I don't really uh, involve myself with her. Um, Yeah. So, yeah, most of them I'm on good terms with. One of the interesting things I find about you is because you wanted to be an actress, right? So you studied. You... Well, I was an actress, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, like, you couldn't you couldn't initially get into the industry, and that's part of the reason why you became a bit of a reporter and presenting. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, I was in Australia, and, you know, I was in some pilots for some big soaps, and I did a very you know, well-known commercial over there, and... Um, oh, you know, I got the lead in an episode of a drama and stuff like that, but it was it was sort of very piecemeal. And I got to the age of about 26, 27. I'd gone back to university and finished my degree over there, and I just thought, no, I want a steady income, but I still want to be able to use the skills I've I've learned in terms of a um, bit of an actress. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll go into TV presenting, and that that's what sort of led into that, and that went into journalism, news reading, all the rest of it. So, yeah, I didn't act for, oh, I don't know, about 20 years, a long time, because I was so involved in TV. But, you know, there's a, there's, in TV presenting, there's a hell of a lot of acting involved in that. You know, yeah, you, well, can't, you can't have an introvert being a TV presenter. You just can't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But how much of it is actually following the teleprompter as opposed to you going off on your, off your own and offbeat, so to speak? Oh, well, I did it. I mean, I, because, 
you know, I did like sports shows. Um, you know, I did current affairs, which was interviewing people. No, a lot of it I've ad libbed a lot. Mm. Um, yeah, a newsreader, you don't get the chance to do that, and nor should you. I mean, really, you're just a vehicle for the news, so you shouldn't ad lib, and you certainly shouldn't comment on on the news story. Um, but no, I've been pretty lucky. I've had some great presenting gigs, which uh, in which I was able to show my personality. Yeah, because I, I remember you did some stuff for sixty minutes. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. No, I presented sixty minutes, and I did stories for them, and um, yeah, and twenty twenty, and Nightline, and I read the news um, for TV three on and off, and did the weekend news, and no, I, I've done a lot of stuff. You have done a lot of stuff. Is there anything yeah. that you haven't done that you want to do at this stage? I would really like to go back and have another crack at the weakest link. I would like, and that's back on in Australia. I don't know how well it's doing. I saw a, a clip of that the other day and Magda Zabanski, is that her name, you know, um, from Kath and Kim, she's presenting it. And I only saw like 30 seconds of it, but it seemed that she was a bit too nice. Yeah, you can't the be whole, nice. No, the whole thing about presenting the weakest link is you've got to be a complete cow. And um, and the contestants love that. I mean, you know, and, and also I think a lot of the presenters on the weakest link, everything was scripted, whereas I made it all up as I went. And that was the best thing I ad-libbed the whole thing. But if people said, oh, my God, you're such a bitch, you know, I'd say, yeah, it was all scripted. I had to be. But, of course, I it wasn't. I just made it up. Um, so, yeah, I really would like to have another crack at that. Um, but it's a very expensive. I'm just turning off the central heating because it's boiling in here. Um, it, yeah, it's a very expensive show to do. I mean, the lighting rig was like a hundred thousand. It was it was huge, and that was twenty years ago. So um, nobody has the rights to it here. I don't think at the moment because I've actually looked into it. But um, yeah, I'd love to do that again. That was the most fun I think I've ever had on TV. Well, that really put you on the map as well, right? Everyone knew who you were after that. Well, the thing was that um, it was the same time. I had three gigs at once. I was on Treasure Island. I was doing The Weakest Link. And um, I was also in a drama called Street Legal yes. with Jay Lagaya yeah. and Catherine Kennard. So I had three pretty high-profile things at one time. So, yeah, that was um, that was a great time of my life, I have to say. Because how did how did that come about? You even getting the the gig for the weakest link? Did you actually advocate for that, or advocate for that, or were you kind of no? Just off no, the right? I knew. Um, I was asked if I was interested by um, Daryl McEwen, who I'd worked with a lot at TV Three, and um, he was working for Touchdown, I think it was then. It's now Warner Brothers. So I'd worked with him a lot. And he just said, I think you'd be perfect for this. And I was up against somebody else for it. And we auditioned. And, um, yeah, and I just won. Uh, the network said, no, she's perfect. So um, that's how that happened. And after the first series, it was the number one rating program um, in the country. But then, unfortunately, for some ridiculous unknown reason, they put us up against um, One Day Cricket. And, of course, we were never going to succeed. I think they thought that we could fight, you know, um, compete yes. against that. And, yeah. of course, we couldn't. Yeah, I think some sometimes a lot of those shows that get cancelled, it's just because they're yeah. put in the wrong slot, right? Absolutely. Yeah, it was a real shame. Yeah. I mean, they could easily bring mm. it back. No problem. I don't. I don't well, know. yeah, I suppose so. Um, if they, yeah, they've just got to get the rights and they've got to have the budget. And I mean, the Bible, it was BBC. And the Bible was like this that we had to follow. It was so strict and it had to be followed to the absolute letter. Um, yeah. So it was it was great fun. Yeah, because how, how long, uh, each episode, how long would it take to shoot? Um, I think we shot two a day from memory. Yeah, I think we shot two a day. It was a long time ago, so that was like twenty years ago. So yeah, it was it was so good because you're so cold and calculated with it. It was it was brilliant. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I had to be. I mean, it was an acting job, really. Yeah. Um, I had to wear black and I had to have red hair and yeah. So. Yeah. Did it, did any of the contestants really get offended by what you said, or 
They no, all... that was the no, that was the incredible thing. The funniest shows were the celebrity shows. The <laughs> celebrity shows were absolutely hilarious. And I just loved doing those. But the, the weirdest thing was that um, in the green room afterwards with the um, the contestants, they would say to me, oh, my God, that was the most fun I've ever had. It was so fantastic. And I'm thinking, really? Because I, you know, tore strips off you. Um, but they said that was just brilliant. So I thought, okay, right. Um, yeah, so, no, I don't think I offended anybody. Did I you... think everybody knew. They knew what they were going to be up for, and I think they just thought that it was fun. Did you, like, plan anything in advance? Like, you'd write out something or think of something in your head, like, oh, I'll use you that. You couldn't on really. This. No, it had to be off the cuff, cuff all the time because you were you were answering what they were saying. They'd say something stupid, <laughs> and I would have to come back with a quip. So, no, it was all off the cuff. Oh, you're absolutely so you brilliant. Be on it. form. <laughs> Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Because <laughs> um, how was it when you were doing Celebrity uh, Treasure Island? Because how long were you actually on the island for? Uh, well, the first time I was on for nearly two weeks, I think. God, that was hell. That was absolute hell. Um, so I did four of them. I did two as a t contestant, one as the host, and one as a director. And, oh, the contestant ones were just ghastly. They were ghastly because, you know, everybody thinks, used to think, and maybe that's what they do now, but in those days they think, oh, you know, um, it comes across that it's really tough, but we know that, you know, you have a bed and you have a shower and you have, we had nothing. We had no toilet, no shower. Um, we, yeah, there was, there was just nothing. Um, luckily, the second series that I did that I was a contestant um I was uh with with some guys that um you know really helped me out and um yeah and, and they did a lot for me but um most of the time it was yeah it was sheer help and the first series um like we didn't have anything to eat all we had was flour what we had we had flour so we could make damper with some water. Um, oh, my God. I know. I'm just trying to think. Uh, obviously, you had challenges for food. So we won a challenge whereby we got this almighty great tuna. Well, what the hell were we supposed to do with a tuna? I mean, you could put that. But by the end of the day, it stank because we didn't have a fridge. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, really. Um, anyway, but... My God, that made you tough. That really made you tough. That show. Yeah, I, I bet. I mean, it looked it looked it looked like hell. I was like, oh man. Yeah, that... it was hell. It was hell. Um, so, but luckily, like I had Josh Cronfelt with me, and I had Coxie, and you know, Coxie built us sort of a shelter because he was a builder, and That's right. you know, so we were, we were we were lucky with the guys. But um, no, it was really it was hell. So I, I suppose it would have been far different being a director and being the host. Oh, yeah. 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 But, I mean, director's really, really hard work. My God, that's hard work. You know, you're up at dawn. You're over there by 7 in the morning across at the contestants' island. You are working and running around and shooting all day in, like, 35 degrees heat. Um, I have never drunk so much water in my life. Then you get back to the island at night, you go and have a cold shower, you're sharing a long drop with 90 Fijians. Um, you, yeah, you have a shower, then you have to um, go back up to the bar or the, the, the crew area, you have to write up what's happened during the day, you have dinner, you maybe have one beer because you've got to keep your marbles. I remember I was walking back up to... Um, the, the crew quarters and a sea snake went right in front of me on the path because you know sea snakes come ashore at night yeah and this black and white thing and they're deadly but I mean they can only open their mouths like that so the only time the only place they could really get you is like here and if they if, like if you're in the sea and you put your hand up and they get you here then you're pretty much stuffed um but yeah I thought holy crap there's a, a sea snake right in front of me 
And, and so you would never get to bed at night before 11 or 12, and then you're up at sort of 6 the next morning. It's, that's pretty hard going too. Mm, yeah, yeah. Well, so I- you, don't, you don't go into TV production unless you are prepared to work your butt off. Long, long days. Long, long days. Like the film industry, very long days. Yeah. Yeah. So do you prefer act- acting or directing or like what what's what one do you prefer the most? What one well what well, what one do well, you do I'm enjoy not the involved most? I'm not involved in TV production anymore. That's that's yeah, that's really a young person's game. Um I think what I'm doing now is very rewarding in terms of my theatre company. Yeah. Um and we're actually at a pretty exciting phase at the moment um, because we're preparing for the world premiere of a New Zealand play by Catherine Burnett, who wrote Fresh Eggs. And um, this is a play called The Camper Van. Um, we decided to bring in an outside director because we think we probably need to do that a bit now. So we've got Simon Prast, who... who um, is you know was in gloss in the in the eighties and has done a lot of work for Auckland Theatre Company. He um, ran the um, Auckland Arts Festival. We've got an amazing cast. Um, the the only ones I can confirm at the moment are Lisa Chapel coming up and also um, Andy um, shit what's his name Andrew Granger um, from Auckland Theatre Company. So yeah, it's. We've got the Auckland Theatre Company set designer. It's going to be an awesome set. So we're sort of hoping that Tadpole can become a bit of an ATC satellite company, mm. and that would be that would be amazing for us. There's a lot of work involved with theatre that I think a lot of people don't realise, right? I mean, there's so much that goes there's on. There's a hell of a lot of work. Yeah, yeah. There's a hell of a lot of work, and... Um, you know, because we are bums on seats theatre and um, we are catering to middle class uh, North Shore audiences, mainly 40 and over, but we do want to make our audience, we, don't, we want to appeal to younger people if we can. We don't do experimental theatre, so we never get, we don't get funding from Creative New Zealand because we don't do a lot of diverse, um, experimental, we oh. just don't do that. We do bums on seats theatre. So with a lot so of we the- rely, we rely on ticket sales and sponsors and patrons and borrowing, big borrowing, stealing and, yeah. <laughs> well, th- one of the good things I think about theatre is it really, uh, it really helps you to fine-tune your craft as an an actor and actress, right? Oh, because you're in front of an totally. audience. You can't yes. screw up. Yeah. Well, somebody screws up every night, pretty much. Um, there's always you get off stage and think, Jesus, holy crap, how did that happen? One time, one of the guys, we had a two-hander, very, very experienced actors, and the end of the first half, the, wow, that, God, that was fast. Oh, they, they, they must have been going for it. Well, they'd missed six pages. So yeah, I know. And but you know what? The audience didn't know. Uh, they don't know the play. It still made sense. And so the sort of weird stuff like that that can happen in theatre. Um, invariably, in any run that you're doing, one night you will dry. You will think, "Holy crap, what's next?" And mm. yeah, that's it's how you get out of it. Mm. Really. So it's what, hard and it's very nerve-wracking. Well, yeah, I suppose it is. I mean, I suppose the the best stuff is if it if it if you do make a mistake and the audience doesn't know, then that's fine. Mm. I suppose it's it's only mm-hmm. really bad if the audience can pick up on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that that can be that can be a bit unfortunate. Um, but that doesn't happen too often because normally that's that's the role I mean in a in a one-man show that would yeah that's tough but normally um with a company it's as important I think for a company to support each other and help people get out of the shit and by the end of a rehearsal by the end of a rehearsal process you pretty much know everyone else's lines anyway yeah you know what's coming next 
you have to really you have to it's, it's it's irresponsible to only know your own lines you really have to know the others as well or have a pretty good idea because you have to be able to cope with that so have you learned to kind of have a bit of a photographic memory i suppose if you look at a page yeah. of lines boom you can yeah. learn them quite quickly yeah that's how that's how i remember it that's how i remember it as a photographic memory and also i um, you've got to learn it. You can't learn it um, sort of ad libby. You can't think, oh, well, that's the sense. Well, A, because the playwright doesn't want you to. The playwright has written those lines in a certain way because that works best. So it is up to you and it is your responsibility to um, repeat those lines exactly as they have been written. But it also helps you to learn them. Mm. It's got to be absolutely as precise as possible um, and that helps you remember them so what was the reason why you set up tadpole productions and the theater company um well i was invited to by uh by two guys and they said do you want to be involved and i thought yay yes i do and i thought that is also a way that i'm going to get work on stage i thought hey if i've got my own company i can put myself in my own place um, most actors have to make their own work um, and have to actively seek out work. It is very seldom that uh, you just get cast by other people. You have to um, go out and actively seek it. Yeah, it's a hard industry. It's a very hard industry. Yeah, it is. Almost um, oversaturated to the point where you've got so many people fighting over breadcrumbs. It seems. Oh, I know, I know. And and so many actors do, you know, do work for nothing. And and what I've found out is that there, there's so many um, the theatre companies and theatre work that um, is on a co-op basis whereby the actor only gets paid if they make money, which is tough. I mean, at least tough. we can say with Tadpole that, you know, the actors always get paid. And started off, when we first started, boy, it was virtually nothing. But no, we, we try to pay reasonable money. Were you affected uh, quite a lot during the early stages of COVID? Totally. We, yeah. we did nothing last year. Yeah. We just couldn't do anything. All we had was one play reading. Um, so we had to put off our play in May, and then our next one was going to be in October, and we had another lockdown in September. So we, we did nothing. Oh, that's unfortunate. Would you ever yeah. go on the road and maybe do a couple – Outside of yeah, we look. We no, we we have looked at that. Um, and like for example, with Shirley Valentine that we we did in May, which basically we were turning people away um, at the end of the run. We were considering doing that, but um, we'd already committed to the camper van, and so the money that we made out of Shirley Valentine, instead of squeezing in another run of 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 Shirley Valentine, which involved, you know, you're then spending money um, transferring to another theatre, the, the advertising for it, getting the rights again. We decided, well, we'll just put it off. It may happen in the future, but at the moment, we just want to concentrate on the camper van because as a New Zealand premiere of production, um, we're, we're really, really honoured and thrilled that Tadpole is, is, you know, being involved with that. Yeah. So it's better that we better that we really put all, all our eggs into that. Makes sense. Must be yeah. still still quite difficult though, because everything's still up in the air with COVID. You know, you can go into lockdown it is a bit, time. This, yeah, this this latest thing is a bit scary. It is a bit scary. Um we're just gonna box on and, and see what happens. And uh yeah, I mean we've we've done we've shot the 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 photos for the for the shoot. We're getting the artwork done now. We have nearly finished casting. Um, we haven't started rehearsals yet. That starts in September in uh, August. <clears throat> so yeah, we're just hoping and praying that we can you know keep going. That nothing interferes with it. Yeah, yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. I hope it all works mm -hmm. out. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so do we. So uh, when you uh, studied a drama in in the yeah. UK. What do you think was the most uh, or the best piece of advice or best thing that you learned from that experience? Golly. Because I've always heard that you you were supposed to act different 
on television as you do on, on say theater or even film? Like you're supposed well, in terms of, in terms yeah. of how you say things and enunciate. Um, yeah, I think what happened, like I went to drama school, um, would you believe 40 years ago? So a long, long time I went in, in London and so it wasn't method acting. It was um, much more, it was stage orientated. It wasn't, we didn't do any on camera stuff. So um, yeah, that was the difference. It was, I suppose, um, far more directed at, at theatre. Um, and they had this funny, there was a bit of a snob factor about commercials. Oh, no, you, know, you don't want to lower yourself to doing a commercial. You don't want to lower yourself to doing um, television, you know, soap operas, all that sort of thing. So there was that sort of feeling. Um, whereas now, obviously, you know, you do whatever you can. And, um, and also one of my, one of my, the guys I went through drama school with, he ended up getting a very long run um, in EastEnders and becoming very famous um, with that. So he certainly had a very good career um, out of a soap opera. Um, but my God, that was one of the, the best two years of my life. We had such a ball. We had such a great time. It was so much fun. Um, and yeah, basically what they did, and I, I think that's probably what they still do at drama school, is the process is they, you start off, you get in, so you're very full of yourself, you're very confident. You're obviously an extrovert. So what they do is they break you down. They basically tell you that you're useless and you're nobody and you're nothing and they break you down and break you down until you're rock bottom and you're thinking, oh, my God, this is so bad. I'm, I'm hopeless. I'm useless. And then they steadily build you up again. Now, you know, in, in considering sort of how people are these days with mental health and, and with, you know, what, what's going on with COVID, I, I don't know how kids cope with that, but that was the process that we had. And so you did find that some people at the, at the very bottom, at the lowest ebb, they couldn't take it and they dropped out. And that was probably pretty damaging. So what's the reason they do that? Because they want to start with a blank canvas. Right. So they want to get you out of all your bad habits. They want to, yes, literally see you as a blank canvas, a piece of putty that then they can build up, build up, teach you techniques, teach you ways of thinking, ways of approaching your art and get rid of any bad habits that you've had before then that you might have learned from, say, Amdram or school or, you know, stuff that worked, you know, on stage in secondary school is not going to work on stage at Auckland Theatre Company or Tadpole Theatre Productions. Mm, makes sense. Yeah. Because of the industry that you work in, you must meet a lot of snobby people, I suppose, or people who are very it's superficial, disconnected from reality somewhat. Do you think? No, I don't think so. I think quite the opposite. Okay, well, no, that's good. No, I, I, I think with actors, you're, God, if you're, if you're like that, you're not going to survive in the industry. I think the thing about a lot of actors is that they're really down to earth. The most successful ones are really down to earth. The ones that are snobby and disconnected from reality, they don't make it. <laughs> um, they well, really don't. You, you, you know, um, actors are... are what I, what I do find with actors, especially from the producer's point of view, is that they can be, yeah, they can be a little bit unreliable. They can be hard to get hold of, hard to pin down, a little bit flighty, but basically if they're not really professional, they just don't get the work. And, you know, when we audition people and we think of people for a role, we actually don't audition many people. We know of their work. Um, we know how they're regarded in the industry. And if you're regarded as difficult or you're a raging drunk or whatever, mm. you're not going to get, we just don't cast you. We just haven't got time, you know, haven't got time to stuff around. Well, there must be so many people you audition as well, whether it's for a theatre company. No, we don't. We don't audition many people. Really? So with we, our... may audition, we may audition younger people, but actors... Um, that are my age, younger, we know them. We know what they've done. We know their work. 
we know their reputations. So, for example, Andy Granger and Lisa, who are in camper van. I've worked with Lisa. I've been with Lisa in two or three productions. Um, I regard her as a good friend. She's one of the best actors, most talented people in the industry. Andy Granger, I've never seen him do a bad piece of work. He is so professional. He's uh, he's incredibly talented. Um, you don't need to audition those people. Mm. You've got the full package right there. So with everything always being on the go, because obviously you've always got something on, how do you, how do you de-stress? How do you stay calm? Mm. Um, <laughs> laughing yoga? No. <laughs> um, sometimes I don't stay calm. I, yeah, I just try to take a deep breath, but I have my moments. Um, I don't know, really. Um, I'm actually a lot more relaxed than I used to be. And um, I have a big life outside of theatre. And, you know, I have I have a lovely life with, um, with, I mean, don't laugh, but honestly, with my girlfriends and going away on golfing trips, which is not just golf, but having a hilarious time drinking and carrying on and just playing sport at the same time is fantastic. Um, we go to different parts of New Zealand. Um, yeah, I just, you know, I'm learning French, which I love. Um, I usually travel a lot. I have a, I have a big life and a really nice life. So, um, yeah, I'm very lucky, very lucky. Yeah, very lucky. Sounds, yeah. sounds amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I don't take anything for granted, absolutely. Um, toughest thing at the moment is that, you know, my son is um, in the UK and I can't go and visit him. Well, I can, but I don't know about about quarantine. But um, if I have to, I'll just do it. But I'm not free to do anything until um, October. And then I'll just have a look. And, yeah, I don't know how I'd cope on my own. If I was with my husband, I don't think it'd be quite so bad. But on my own, I don't know. And obviously that's not going to lift till next year, even though I'll be fully vaccinated. So I find that tough. And I don't think that's fair, actually. I don't think it's fair that if you're fully vaccinated that you still have to do quarantine. I, I think it's bloody ridiculous, especially as now um, air crew can come in from the States and if they're fully vaccinated, they don't have to quarantine. Well, why not us? What's the difference? Yeah, well, it's a valid point. I think I, yeah. I think the main thing is because I think people are just worried that uh, it might mutate and a variant, another variant comes that can well evade yeah, the but, vaccine, I suppose. Yeah, but I mean, God, that, it's going to be with us for the rest of our lives. I yeah. think. Yeah. So we we do just have to live with it. And okay, we might need a booster each year, but everybody has a flu shot. Well, I don't, but everybody, most a lot of people have a flu shot. Um, so you know, it's just a fact of life. Yeah. So is there anything in terms of your day-to-day -day lifestyle that's changed because of COVID or is it still relatively no. normal? No. 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 It's, it's, I'm doing everything I used to do. Yeah. Okay. Except for the traveling yeah. part, obviously. Except for the traveling part. Yeah. Traveling overseas. Um, uh, planning to go to Australia in September because my daughter and her fiance are having their engagement party actually in Australia and quite a few of our friends are going. So that's really cool. That will be great. And that will be the first time I will have traveled overseas will be September. Um, so unless something like this stuffs it up, uh, which would be a hell of a shame, but um, yeah. Well, it's just one yeah, of those things. You just, yeah, yeah. You just have to wait and see, I suppose. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to ask a, because it came to my mind in regards to the Real Housewives of Auckland. Like, how many people yeah. did you have to audition for that? Oh, quite a few. A lot, actually. Um, I I probably put forward about 10 people, but they would have auditioned and met a lot of um, other people um, that I didn't even know about. So I would think 30 to 40 probably. Um, and a lot of people didn't get the gig because they realised, the production company realised they would not be emotionally resilient. 
enough. Oh, right. So how do you yeah. how do you figure that? I mean, what do they even have to do during an audition? Like what? Oh, they that was the funny thing. That was a funny thing. So during the audition, um, they would have these lunches. So the group of women would get together and sort of have a long lunch that definitely had a bit of booze involved. And they would pick women um, and put them together that had a bit of history, usually negative. And it didn't take much because the women knew that it was sort of an audition process. Um, you know, one would say to the other something like, oh, yeah, I remember you, you, you know, you cold shouldered me at some um, event and you were a complete bitch to me and then <laughs> you know the <laughs> off it would go it was fantastic so um yeah that you'd see what happened oh it was it was incredible and that's why I'm sitting there thinking oh my god do I really want to be involved in this so, <laughs> so, so, so that's why yeah. I sort of I sort of tried to be the peacemaker in a way um the voice of reason, and Anne definitely was too. She didn't buy into any of it, and she she got away with quite a lot. And honestly, behind the scenes, she and I, we would just laugh and laugh and laugh. And if I hadn't had her, I think I probably would have gone a bit nuts. Yeah, I mean, some of it was just outright insane, so OTT. Yeah. Like it would start <laughs> yeah. off so normal. I, I think I remember yeah. discreetly as the, the acting class where Julia was imitating you and it was all fun and in jest and then it, yeah. just, it just went OTT yeah. like super quickly. Yeah, then all of a sudden she just went feral. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. what's, what's so, up with this? Um, yeah, I, I don't know. It was, it was like, I'm sure they said to her, hey, listen, you've got you've to turn on Lou and do that. I mean, they would have said that. Um, and that was fine. I mean, I wasn't even, I, I couldn't give a damn about it. Um, basically, yeah, what you had to do was just be prepared for anything. Yeah. So how do they do it? Because they film everything, right? And then they, you're in a room separately where you're just talking to the camera. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, yes, you did your master interviews and they would you would go back on um, each incident like that. So when we got back from um, Port Douglas and we had the infamous boat incident, um, you would have to talk through that um, usually, yeah, sort of in the present tense because they would usually put it over footage and you would go from beginning to end what happened and, yeah, and, the, and then obviously they would, uh, you know, in, intersperse the, the um, reactions and use your voiceover and, yeah, that's how they did it. Mm. So did you watch back the whole series? Or yep. Yeah. Yeah. And did it, did it, was it presented in a way that how it was? Cause you know how stuff can be edited and it's slightly um, changed or was it largely yeah, kept no, intact? Actually, actually, I think it was pretty fair because people said things that were pretty outrageous and, um, you know, you've got to take responsibility for everything that comes out of your mouth. You have to remember that, that anything you are going to say is quite likely going to end up on screen. So, even stuff out of context, you have to be careful. Yeah, yeah. Because mm, mm. um, you did some stuff for The Apprentice as well, or well, the first one. Was it the yeah, one? yeah, yeah. Yeah, I directed, I was a director on The Apprentice. Yeah, because how was that? Um, that was pretty tame, really, <laughs> compared to this. Yeah, it was very tame. I haven't watched the latest Apprentice, so I don't know. I don't know if there's much bitching or backstabbing or anything. But really, in the one we did, it was pretty tame. Yeah, I started watching the the newest one. Um, yeah, and it is pretty tame. I think one of the guys, yeah. one of the guys uh, who's who's on the side of Mike Pero. I think he's from the UK, and he's talking yeah. about how Kiwis are so nice compared to yeah. the UK. They'd be, all be shitting on each other and. Yeah. Yeah. So well, of course, well, of course, all these these young people will be very worried about how they come across, I would think, because of um, you know, job prospects. And uh whereas like with the housewives, 
theoretically, they don't need a job, so they wouldn't care. But if you're a young person starting off in your career, it doesn't matter whether you're an entrepreneur or not, um, you know, uh, yeah, I would be pretty nervous as, as a young person. So you come across as a bit of a psycho, um, it's not going to get you a, a good job, is it? Yeah, well, I've always wondered why people choose to do those type of... Well, a lot of people just want to be famous. They just want to be on TV, um, especially these days. And, yeah, you look at those um, Bachelor and Bachelorette and all that sort of stuff, um, they, they just want to be on TV. So, yeah. But you can be you you get like your ten seconds of fame and then that's it, right? I mean, not necessarily. Well, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Um, it's only yes, it's it's only um, if you're in a reality show, a, a huge one, maybe like Housewives, that's a worldwide franchise that you know you've got a, a shot at being in the big time. Really, um, I have no doubt that if Real Housewives of the second, if we'd had a second series. I think it would have gone on to be huge. I really do. Because, I mean, geez, I, you know, I was recognised in London and in the States, would you believe, after the first really? series? Uh, yeah, which was bizarre. Mind you, I did Broken Wood Mysteries too, and I was recognised in the States from that. That is so successful, Broken Wood, um, that I got recognised in California. So you're just walking down the street and people would stop you and be like, hey. Yeah, they'd say, oh, my God, I've just watched Broken Wood Mysteries. I'm thinking, really? I'm in Southern California. I know. Very strange. But, um, yeah, no, I think people don't realise how huge, how well that, that show has done internationally. Yeah, particularly if you're only in tune with the New Zealand market. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm. But would you want to be famous, yeah. though, you know, getting stopped all the Overseas, time? Overseas or... Well, either really. I mean, if you're getting stopped all the time, you kind of lose your sense of privacy. No, I don't think so because I, um, I mean, I know people recognise me, but um, I just I don't really engage. I I can't be bothered. I mean, I don't. You know, if somebody says, "Oh hi," what I get a lot is, um, "I've met you before." Or, yeah, we, we met sometime. Um, uh, yeah, all that sort of stuff. And I think, no, you haven't met me before. But that's fine. That's fine. Um, I think with, with a lot of um, celebrities or well-known faces, um, a lot of people don't want to be seen to recognise you, especially in Greylin and Ponsonby. <laughs> really? <laughs> when you walk into a cafe and people sort of turn away because they think oh no I'm not going to I'm not going to recognize her it's quite funny do you go out of your way to deliberately be like hi <laughs> god no are you joking absolutely oh my god I couldn't think of anything worse no 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 yeah I mean I you know I've had a great career um I I'm I'm happy with the profile I've got um you think you're heavily disguised when you're walking along the road in your sunglasses and your cap and all the rest of it. And then I, and people say, oh, I saw you the other day walking along the waterfront. Oh, my God, that's embarrassing. Um, but, you know, I have been in the media here um, for 30 years. That's a long time. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I'm and I've only... done a lot of stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm 35 years old, so yeah, it's well. I'm almost, you, I'm almost twice your age, so. And you've yeah. been in media like almost as long as uh, I've been alive, so. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. It's crazy. <laughs> That's scary, eh? It's crazy <laughs> when you put it like that. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Mm. Well, hey, uh, I'll wrap up there. Thank you so much for okay. doing this. I, I, That's this, right. Yeah, yeah. I know you're in, in, extremely busy, so I appreciate you taking the time out to do this. No, it's been fun. Yeah. I've enjoyed it. Yeah. Um, and, I, yeah, I hope you get some good stuff out of it. Oh, yeah, yeah. I've I've really enjoyed it. And it's, oh, it's interesting learning behind about the behind-the-scenes stuff with a lot of the things that you've done. So. Yeah, yeah. Because a lot um, of people don't see this or they don't know about it. They just see what's on TV and they think that's gospel sometimes. Mm, but there's always mm, something behind. Right. Yeah. 
Or is something behind I the scenes? I think big, the biggest thing to remember in going into this industry is um, don't take yourself too seriously. Um, and try to be um, as resilient as you possibly can and as versatile as you can. Great advice. Mm. Well, thank you so much, Louise. I have a no problem, Reece. huge amount of respect for you. Keep, keep oh, doing, thank you. Keep doing your thing. Uh, I'll try. <laughs> I hope everything um, with your um, current plays and everything at the theatre works out. Hopefully thank no you. more lockdowns. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So um, All right. everything works out. But, yeah, take care. That's the show, okay. everyone. Make sure you share, like, and subscribe. Uh, support Louise. You can follow. You're on social media, Instagram. And all that, aren't you? Yeah. 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 That's good. Okay. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye.